This is Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Here's what's coming up on Africa News Tonight. Some health workers there lost their lives and others are injured. He says, we also have some students in Khartoum University who have been stranded there for the past four days and they don't have anything to eat. That's Khartoum resident Hassan Ibrahim, who works as a nurse at Khartoum Teaching Hospital, one of the health facilities forced to shut down. Details coming up. Also, Senegalese singer-songwriter Baba Man has been named UN Goodwill Ambassador. And an influential Tunisian Islamist leader, Rashid Ganucci, was detained yesterday. These stories and more on African News tonight. Our top story, Reuters News reports that a 24-hour truce agreed between Sudan's rival military factions was quickly disrupted by renewed gunfire in the Khartoum capital region this evening, despite U.S. pressure to calm fighting that has touched off a humanitarian crisis. Heavy gunfire echoed in the background of live feeds by Arab television news channels. Residents told Reuters that shooting had not ceased, with one saying they heard an airstrike being carried out in Amdurman, Khartoum's sister city, on the opposite bank of the Nile River. Fighting appeared to tail off close to the 6 p.m. deadline of, for the ceasefire, which coincided with the evening breaking of the daily fast during the Islamic holy month of Ramadan, but heavy gunfire was heard again a short time later. A Reuters reporter in Khartoum said he heard tanks firing after the ceasefire was due to have started. A member of Sudan's resistance committee and umbrella group of activists coordinating street protests say families in Khartoum are in dire need of assistance. Muna Al-Tahir says some committee members are helping desperate families with food and water and medicine. Al-Tahir says civilians are disappointed by the actions of the two military leaders who have decided to fight in the streets of Khartoum. It is extremely terrifying, like... We're just expecting death at any point of time. I stay with my mom, with my kids, uh, my brother, my sister, and other members of the extended family are here. We are living in Khartoum South, which is very close to the rugby third force camps. And I have been hearing the shots all over um, the place, around the clock, on the top of our head. And we're just sitting, doing nothing, like just getting scared, afraid, terrified. And how about uh, food supply? Because this is this is one of the issues that the humanitarian organizations are talking about, that most people who are in Khartoum are running uh, out of supplies. Could you talk to us about your experience? Um, yesterday I went to the nearby shop because I have cash in hand and I bought a couple of stuff. I have them here in, in, in my kitchen, but most of the people, especially the people who are earning their uh, loaf of bread day by day, they're really suffering because they don't have money to buy stuff. And most of the shops are closed and just people are sitting. And this is Ramadan time, don't forget. And people are just like uh, some of them, they have just a couple of dates, you know, they eat uh, during Iftar time. But people are really in a very bad shape. Like we are eating rice and lentils because we are afraid that electricity might go off at any point of time. So we did not buy like meat and chicken. And so we buy only dry stuff and we just cook them and eat. Knowing the Sudanese culture of generosity and uh, sharing the little they have. I lived in Khartoum and during Ramadan, people bring food outside their gates so that anybody passing by can share with them during iftar. Is that still happening? No, not at all. Like Because it's not safe to go outside of your house. It's not safe at all to go even to the nearby shops. So people uh, sit down outside and take food out. This is quite dangerous. And and the, and the, and, and the soldiers are around. They can even, like, they knock over the door and they break the houses. They steal food. They steal water. So we're closing our doors and sitting inside, even like when people knock on our door. If we are not sure who's there, we will not open the door. And we know that people outside, they're hungry. 
at asking for food and we cannot give them food because we are not quite sure if they will come and just take food and go. And what are the Sudanese doing to really de-escalate these two groups fighting? I mean, in Sudan, you have uh, Shiyuk, you have uh, uh, the Grand Mufti, you have, you know, there are lots of religious leaders who could reign on these two to stop fighting during Ramadan. What, what are Sudanese doing? This is not our war as a civilian. This is not our war, the, the change seekers. This is not our war, the one who made the revolution. This is between the rabbit support force and the army. I have absolutely nothing to do with it, and we are paying for it. Like, this is between them. They are fighting, and they are killing each other, and we are also get affected by this. And we cannot do anything about it. We are peaceful people. We believe in peace. We are not carrying guns. We are not carrying anything. We are just sitting and waiting to see how this is will end and where it will take us. We need peace. We need democracy. We need civil government. And we need prosperity for our nation. And those people are just making it because they don't want the civil government to take over. They don't want the, to prosper their seeking to support their, their own benefit, their own like business, their own. They want to be in power. Talking about the, the, the people who have been spearheading the demonstrations in Khartoum asking for a civilian-led government, are you talking to each other? Are you, you know, strategizing? We do talk to each other. The, the resistance committees now are being peaceful stuff as always and ever. They're supporting people by providing water for people who have no water, providing food, trying to get people to the hospital, try to do some first aid services for the people who are injured. So this is what we do, and we have always been doing that. So the resistance committee are quite active within the neighborhood, but because their movement is limited, they don't do much. But as much as they can do, they support people. That's Muna Al-Tahir, member of the Resistance Committee, speaking with John Tanza from Khartoum earlier today. More than 300 Ugandans are stranded amid chaos in Sudan, including students, workers and travelers in transit. The Uganda government says it's working on plans to bring them home safely. Catherine Nambi reports from Kampala. Among the known Ugandans in Sudan are 116 students, 120 workers, 14 in hospitals, and six on short visits. Another 19 are travelers who are transiting through Sudan to Mecca and Medina in Saudi Arabia as part of a Ramadan pilgrimage when the fighting broke out. Nkunyi Njimuwada, a Ugandan legislator, says he has received calls from people in Sudan and parents indicating that their children are stuck in the areas undergoing shelling. Several of our Ugandan nationals narrate that they are trapped in areas of intense fighting, including Uganda nationals and a few passengers from other countries transiting through Sudan. A number of these Uganda nationals are trapped in the Sudan airports. We have information from, from the, these first calls we have received that the fighting in the Sudan has spread to various regions of Sudan. And a number of our nationals who are distressed and who are stranded are in different parts of Sudan. Mwada wants the government to initiate rescue measures and to establish alternative shelters for the stranded Ugandans. In a phone call to the country, Uganda's ambassador to Sudan, Dr. Rashid Yahya Semuddu, says he has not received any reports of any injured or attacked Ugandans in Sudan. Regardless of the fighting, uh, which is going on in the middle of the town, uh, we will be following up uh, the situation with all the, our citizens who are here. The Ugandans who are in Khartoum so far are safe. He says the travelers who are stuck at the Sudan's main airport in Khartoum have since been transferred to safe places until they can be evacuated. Uh, we are in contact with, with them. And uh, we are also in contact with the, the airline, which was supposed to take them to Jeddah. They were moved to a safe place uh, in, uh, in one of the hotels in Khartoum. And uh, the airline they gave us assurance that they will, get, they, they, they will cater for everything, for all the time they will be in the hotel. 
as they are waiting for the situation to calm down and uh, they open their airport. John Mulimba is Uganda's Minister of State for Foreign Affairs. He says the Ugandan government is trying to verify the actual number of nationals now in Sudan and is working together with neighbors and aid organizations to provide all needed support to their citizens. The ministry has approached the International Organization for Migration, IOM, and requested support and assistance to evacuate Ugandans who may wish to return home. In addition, the minister has requested the UN for assistance for possible evacuation. The government is working with our regional and international partners to monitor the situation and urges actors to stop fighting and return to constructive dialogue and recommit the principles of the transitional process as the only way to lead to national conservation and peace. Clashes between Sudan's military and the country's main paramilitary force that started on Saturday have reportedly left over 100 people dead in Khartoum. Claims of a day-long ceasefire agreement by the paramilitary rapid support forces have been dismissed as propaganda by Sudan's army. This is Catherine Nambi for VON News in Kampala. U.S. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield had a blunt message for Sudan during a statement at the U.N. Security Council saying, I'm asking the security forces as directly as I can put down the guns and start talking. But Joseph Siegel, director of research at Africa Center for Strategic Studies, told VOA senior analyst Mohammed El Shanawi that there are concrete reasons behind the escalating conflict between Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, head of the paramilitary rapid support forces, and army leader Abdel Fattah al Burhan. This conflict has been building up for a long time. Both of these military actors have political ambitions that they don't want to give up on. And neither have had a deep commitment to the political transition to which they had signed up for. So you know, that has been their common cause for the last four years since the uh, ousting of uh, Omar al-Bashir, the longtime dictator in Sudan, and how the military has maintained control, even though it has been deeply unpopular in Sudan. However, both sides realize that this uh, status quo arrangement is not viable. The economy in Sudan is deteriorating rapidly. You know, there's hyperinflation around 300% per year. And there's just a deep lack of trust in the military and a lack of legitimacy. And so it's not a, a viable arrangement, you know, not going to get international recognition. And so that they were going to have to move in one way or another towards a transition to civilian leadership, to a democratic government. And as part of this, there would have to be a single unified chain of military command. And in practical terms, this would have required General de Gallo to fold his forces into the Sudan armed forces of General Brahan. And that's something that Hemeti was simply unwilling to do because by giving up his militia forces, the RSF, he effectively is giving up his biggest lever for political influence in Sudan. Burhan, who alongside Dagalo, ousted Sudan's long-time leader Omar al-Bashir in 2019 and played a key role in the military coup two years later, said his former ally had rebelled against the state and, if captured, would be tried in a court of law. What do you make of that statement? Well, I think it's an effort on the part of Burhan to posture and try to uh, demonize Kameti, even though they have been partners here for most of the past four years, and to try and suggest that it is Hemeti or General Degado who is the one working outside the law, and that it is Burhan who is trying to uphold the law. I think it is largely an effort to try to rally some support from civilian leaders, general public, and international community. However, you know, most civilian leaders in the public are deeply skeptical of these claims. General Burhan has regularly stalled in efforts to move the transition forward. He is the one who led the October 2021 coup that derailed the transition process back then. 
And so I think it's part of a, a mutual effort between Burhan and Hameti to cast the other as the villain in, in this saga. On the other hand, Hameti said his group will pursue the leader of Sudan's armed forces, Abdel Fattah Burhan, and bring him to justice, while Sudan's army called on paramilitary fighters to defect and join the armed forces. How could such maximalist positions impact any chance of dialogue in the future? I think we're observing how you know many military leaders approach conflict resolution. They're trying to use force and violence and to demonize the other side as a way of rallying support and rallying their troops to their cause. I think beyond that, you know, these public statements we're seeing from both military leaders lays bare the deeply personal nature of the rivalry. While the two have been partners in the military government since 2019, there's never been a great level of comfort. They're very different actors, very different characters coming from different parts of the country, different ways they've gained power. So there's always been a rivalry underneath the surface. And I think what we're seeing here over the past few days is that rivalry coming out into the open. I think the other takeaway from these statements is that this conflict will not be resolved by these two leaders themselves coming to their good senses and sitting down to negotiate some sort of agreement. It's going to require engagement of civilians within Sudan, of regional and international partners who can talk to each of these military actors and to bring in some more moderate thinking, help them to see how it's in their interest to move to a negotiating position. That was Joseph Siegel, Director of Research at Africa Center for Strategic Studies, speaking with VOA's Mohammed El Shanawi. We have immigrated to the United States, helping their native countries is a big part of their lives. Recently, a group of East Africans gathered to discuss ways to assist those back home. Abdulaziz Osman has the story narrated by Salim Salamon. In a two-day event organized by the UN International Organization for Migration, or IOM, East African ambassadors to the U.S. and leaders from the diaspora community discussed ways to contribute to the economic development of their home countries. One of the speakers was Robi Kakenji, the Ugandan ambassador to the U.S. It is really, really important that we continue to be engaged because through that engagement is where you now get mentorship. It's where you now get It's how you begin to understand your role as being a citizen of this country, but also being a citizen of where you come from. Lemma Waldesembet, a professor of finance at the University of Maryland, says it's about more than just sending money back home. Those of us in the diaspora have left that region, but the region has not left us. So this is a mechanism for us to give back. We give back just not money, but also capacity building, technical assistance, and get connected so that we help develop where we came from and impact livelihood. Many attendees say one goal is to give workers in their home countries the skills that employers need. Jerono Ratich, an associate dean for belonging, diversity and inclusion at Indiana University, is one of many Kenyan diaspora members who travels home to give back. As a founder of a Kenyan Students and Diaspora Foundation, Ratich said her organization took teachers back to Kenya to work with universities, mentor graduate students and help curriculum development. But it's not always an easy job. So they look at you very skeptical as if you want to take over their positions, especially the those in leadership. I'm like, no, I'm just here to help. I'm just here to empower because I see the opportunities that are outside. The International Organization for Migration has been helping the Somali government on a national diaspora policy, which is slated to be ratified this year. The policy is intended to unify and mobilize Somali diaspora networks to help rebuild the nation. Saida Sha'ia works for Somalia's foreign ministry. Sha'ia says the new policy will bring new skills and investments to Somalia. So I am an example of that. I grew up in America. Um, and uh, I, went back, I went back to Somalia because Somalia needs my, someone like me who has the skills, who understands the issues, who can contribute in so many different levels. 
Participants said that with continued support and investment, the African diaspora has the potential to be a powerful force for change and progress on the continent. For Abdul Aziz Osman, Salam Salaman, VOA News, Washington. Senegalese singer-songwriter Baba Mal has been named a goodwill ambassador for the UN Convention to Combat Desertification. Mal has long been an activist on climate change and refugees. Since 2003, he has been committed to various development challenges in Africa, working with different UN organizations. The veteran musician released his first album in seven years, Being, on March 31st and will headline the Barbican in London for the first time in 20 years on May 30th. Influential Tunisian Islamist leader Rashid Ganouchi was detained yesterday after a police search, according to his lawyer. The move against the 81-year-old former parliament speaker comes amid growing social tensions and deepening economic troubles in Tunisia. Ganucci heads the Inhada party and is the most prominent critic of President Kais Saeed. Ganucci's lawyer says he was detained for questioning. Ganucci has been detained for questioning in the past on accusations of money laundering and terrorism financing that his party says are politically driven. And with that, we wrap up.